podcast with one David Coulthard this morning. I was left divided, conflicted even, because on one hand it felt like Eddie Jordan was talking truth in that he said that Lewis Hamilton cut a forlorn figure, even that he was dejected. But he went one step further, didn't he, Eddie Jordan, the legend team principal of Jordan F1. He went on to say that Lewis needs a result desperately. What are you talking about, Eddie Jordan? Jeez, these are controversial words. How dare you take the Lord Sir Lewis Carl Davidson Hamilton's name in vain? Because that's exactly what you do. Or is Eddie Jordan doing what Eddie Jordan does and just speaking to some truth? Because I just don't know. And again, this is with my Lewis Hamilton and F1 diehard fan cap very firmly on what's going on Musin? what's going on visual game of ender we'll get to the talk man but i just need to get this off my chest because i don't know i'm conflicted because ostensibly if we're looking at the first two races of this season then surely eddie jordan is right surely lewis hamilton did cut a forlorn dejected figure and why wouldn't he bearing in mind that mercedes have been a dog of a car for the last 24 months, promising him everything, saying that they're going to nail it, that they're going to give him the world, all that's requisite, the minerals with which, as far as a car is concerned, he can go and win himself an eighth world championship. But where has that gone? What's going on with that Toto? Where is that shove? What's the strategy been like? That stuff has been, it's nowhere to be seen. And one man can only have so much patience, right? If you are Sir Lewis Hamilton, particularly given the backdrop. He's had a fantastic car for the past seven, eight years, as near as makes their different. Back to back to back to back. A car capable of winning a championship. And the only time you'll remember that he hasn't won a championship is in 2016. And that was against one, Nico Rosberg, a very fortuitous one, top of the morning oil field. I hope you're good. So I don't know how to take this from Eddie Jordan because yet again, I will reiterate for the avoidance of doubt that I wanted to react as a Lewis Hamilton evangelist would in anger, deny all knowledge. What are you talking about, Eddie Jordan? How dare you talk about the Lord's name? in such vain what are you on about but again i've got to look within myself right i've got to consider these things with all the objectivity that i can possibly and i think eddie jordan as reckless and irresponsible as eddie jordan has been historically with his hot takes you guys will remember he was the first one to break the rumor about one sir lewis hamilton leaving mclaren with a view to join mercedes and we all thought he was on a madness then surely not eddie this is another one of your hair brain schemes behave yourself wind your neck in eddie jordan the rest of the f1 world said and I wanted to say the same at this dejected Lewis Hamilton needs a result. But oh, you know what? Sadly, I, I think he's right. I, I think he's right. Let's address each one of these claims of their own merits. So look, let's look at the second one first. Does Lewis Hamilton need a result? Well, look, he hasn't been fantastic these first two Grand Prix, has he? And there is a, there's a very many reasons that we need to pass out driving that first and foremost of course the car hasn't been fantastic and more than the car not being fantastic it doesn't necessarily inspire confidence we know that it's unbalanced still at the rear we know it has a tendency to snap oversteer so particularly around tracks like Bahrain and Jeddah Corniche in particular a chap like Lewis Hamilton bearing in mind his driving start and what he needs from the wheels underneath him he's not going to go well but the point of contention for Lewis Hamilton fans and Mercedes fans all around the world is that the first benchmark, the first job that an F1 driver needs to do is beat their teammate. And neither one of the two times that we've already gone racing this year has Lewis come close to doing that, neither in quality nor the race. And that's a point of concern. You guys remember at Bahrain that all the talk from Lewis was that qualifying underperformance can be attributed wholly to the fact that he'd skewed the the technicals, the setup of that car for race performance. But what happened to that? Where was that? At Bahrain International Circuit, nowhere to be seen. There was no upside as far as Lewis's race pace 
to be seen. And George Russell spoke to that quite notably, I thought, saying he didn't know that there was even a difference between the car setup. The insinuation being that that was an excuse from Lewis. By the by, though, right, everybody has a bad race from time to time, even the seven time champion. Fast forward to Jeddah, similar story. Initially, their setups being between Messrs and Messrs Russell and Hamilton even. Initially, their setups converged, but then they went their separate ways as free practice progressed. And then what happened during the race and quali? George out-qualified Lewis and out-raced him too. Oh, but you guys will say that there was strategy mishaps and they didn't double stack. But surely Lewis Hamilton has a say in that, no? I've long been saying, criticising one Charles Leclerc for being passive, for lacking assertiveness in the way that Ferrari just hand down strategy calls to him and he just swallows them. Lewis Hamilton, though, is no Charles Leclerc. He's older, much wiser, much more assertive. You hear him frequently effecting constructive challenge over that radio back to the likes of Shove and Bono and Toto Wolf, right? So what's going on now? How, how comes Lewis allowed them to not double stack? Allow them to transpose this strategic downside onto his race in Saudi Arabia. I don't know the bloody answers, Jerry. I have no idea what's going on. Maybe Lewis is on a sabbatical, just on gardening leave and waiting, conserving his energy and managing this all very efficiently until the big challenge, the big one comes next year when he's at Scuderia Ferrari and then he goes hard again. Maybe he has took his foot off the throttle at the age of 39. And would you excuse that? I don't know, peddlers. I, I don't know. I want to say, yeah, of course, he's 39 years old. He's got nothing to prove. He's got all the accolades in the world. However, the, the, the F1 purist in me, this is the time when you see the greats really great, right? The time when these guys roll up their sleeve. The times when the car doesn't have the minerals. The times in Senna in 1993 at a Donington, as an example. Those times are when you see the driver really come to the fore. Drag the car kicking and screaming to 25 points or a championship indeed. You guys will remember 2018 when Lewis Hamilton put that dog of a car at Singapore on pole. One of the goatiest qualifying laps that you'd ever see. So, so I ask you again for the avoidance of doubt. What's going on now? What's the difference? Has Lewis just had enough? Is that why he's cut such a dejected, forlorn figure as Eddie Jordan has alluded to? Is 24 months plus too much for even Lewis Hamilton, a patron saint who's, a, who's personified patience? Has he had enough? I don't know, peddlers. I, I, I want to understand it. Oh, but I'm struggling. I'm lost for words out here. Hence why I'm asking you guys these non-rhetorical questions because I want to understand what's going. Or maybe, let's posit this one. Here's another thesis. Maybe this is just a blip on the radar. Maybe this is two of 24 races. And here on in, over the next 2022, over the next 22, we get a sort of mean reversion. And the true Lewis Hamilton steps up. Maybe maybe because that happened a year ago didn't it not in 23 in 2022 maybe listen but you see me struggling i have no idea i'm hoping lewis the real lewis hamilton st steps up but at 39 years old maybe he has checked i don't know this is bonkers kieran russell number one for the last three years so kieran that's not true this is where we i've got a fact check <laughs> So 21 was the blockbuster year with Max Verstappen, yeah? And then in 22 was where they struggled massively and Lewis held most of the de development talk burden. That year, George beat him. 2023, we saw a difference, right? There we saw mean reversion and Lewis Hamilton nailed George Russell. But it feels like we've done a 180 again. It feels like this is 2022 all over again. And George Russell has the beating potentially of one Lewis Hamilton. I don't know. I have no idea, but I need to figure this out quickly because it's very, 
very concerning for Lewis Hamilton, for fans of racing, for fan, fans of greatness. This is super concerning and I want to explain it. Maybe then the conclusion from all this is that Eddie Jordan was absolutely on the money. Maybe he's nailed his analysis as at March 2024. But I, I need to see that change from Lewis. I'm, I'm desperate to see that change because that's not who Lewis Hamilton is. And then you've got, listen, this is my angle. This has been my angle for the longest time, eh? That I don't want to see the greats waste away in the bloody death valley of design philosophies. Here's what I mean by that. Lewis Hamilton, one of the greatest drivers that we've ever seen, that I've ever seen. I don't want to see him languish in a car for any longer than necessary that's not capable of him winning bringing him a championship. I want to see a 2021 Mercedes that Lewis can strangle, out of which Lewis is capable of extracting every single tenth that's on the table. Same thing, and don't you guys are going to say British bias, oh, you're a Lewis Hamilton fan, Cameron, etc., etc. But listen, I, I wish the same for all the generation of drivers, being, of course, Fernando Alonso, Max Verstappen, put, put him in there as well, and Charles Leclerc too. I, I, I want to see the best go at it in the best machinery, but we're not seeing that at the moment. And maybe in your waterfall analysis, you've got to attribute some of that to Lewis Hamilton. Maybe his interest is dwindling. And you know what? I've heard people argue this as well, and this is worth bringing to the fore. Lewis gains an extra tenth or two when he's racing for 25 points. And there's something to be said for his ability to raise his game a la the last four races of 2021. You guys remember Brazil when he had to come from 100th on the grid when they gave him 25 grid place penalties or whatever and he still came through the field. This dude does not lack the ability to raise his game. But then flip reverse that if we're going to criticise him ever so slightly. They say in football, could Messi do it on a rainy Sunday in Sunderland? And this is the equivalent, right? You can't always be at your best when everything's perfect. Sometimes you got to do one of these. Sometimes you got to roll up your sleeves right and, and optimise in an unoptimal circumstance. And I'd expect from 39-year-old Lewis, seven-time champion, the dude who did the 2018 Singapore qualifying lap, I would expect him to be able to do that. And at the moment, sadly, he's not doing it, is he? For whatever reason. I don't know. I have no answers. Brent says, listening to the V10 engine sounds. Oh, gosh. I wouldn't mind. I'm going to go and listen to some of that in a minute. I promise you. Because it's... Um, I'm a bit depressed at the moment, guys. I'm not even going to lie to you. I just don't know. Normally, I feel like I've got a handle on this and can explain it. Oh, well, Lewis is potentially a bit dialed out. He's taking his foot off the throttle, pending joining Scuderia, Ferrari and all that. But I just can't. Genuinely... I cannot wrap my head around this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And I really want to defend Lewis Hamilton. When I heard Eddie Jordan said that, listen, I thought the, the cheek of the man. How dare you, Eddie Jordan? You haven't been in F1 for about a thousand years. What are you talking about, Eddie Jordan? So you've got a podcast, Formula for Success. Formula for Success even with 1DC, the greatest chin in all of F1. And you're saying this stuff about about Lewis Hamilton et al to be fair to Eddie Jordan this wasn't an unfair analysis this wasn't an isolated incident of his criticism because he levied the same similar criticism at one large stroll not good enough he's going to have to improve going forward said Eddie Jordan his qualifying is good but he's not putting in these good form good performances frequently enough said Eddie Jordan he said similar too about Danny Rick if Danny Rick's going to cement his position in that VB, Cash App, Red Bull, whatever they're calling themselves. The team formerly known as Alpha Tauri, formerly known as Tar Russell, then he's going to have to improve too. If he wants to have a chance, Danny Rick now, says Eddie Jordan, of succeeding, superseding the Mexican Minister of Defence in that Red Bull car, then he's going to have to, I mean, he's going to have to beat his teammate. That's the common denominator in all of this. These F1 drivers, first port of call, needs to be to beat their teammate. Lance Stroll hasn't done it for about a thousand years. He's getting roundly spanked and has always been getting spanked by one Fernando Alonso. Similarly with Danny Rick 
and Yuki Tsunoda and sadly for Lewis Hamilton fans around the world as that March 2024 similarly for one Lewis Hamilton Jamie says hit the like you guys are legends man I'm Alex says he had the best car for more years than every driver in F1 history not gonna lie so you say that to say what Alex <laughs> I often hear this, this is a thesis off trotted out by Lewis Hamilton, they says. So uh, another one is, where were you, Cameron? Why weren't you talking like this about the monotony of one team's dominance when Mercedes were dominating? Well, we had the podcast then and sadly it dropped off because nobody wanted to talk about like 20, 2016 we were doing the podcast and all the chat and debate, the discourse around F1 was was live, right? Because we had something to talk about. The stakes and the friction between Rosberg and Lewis lit a flame. But they're on in 2017. I mean, if Nico had not retired, then we would have had a conversation. But they're on in like 2018, 2019. Nothing was really happening, right? The space was shrinking, not burgeoning. So I completely disagree with that, you know? I don't know. I, I, I don't know why you say that, Alex. He's had a brilliant car. He's been dominant for the most of it alongside Valtteri Bottas. But what, what does that have to do with today's narrative? You say that as if, what, that he's had his fill. That this is some sort of karmic justice now that Lewis Hamilton... I'm not saying I don't care about the the, the ultimate outcome. I just want to see the best drivers in the best cars being able to fight each other because that's that's how I watch F1. That's how I get my kicks out of F1. So forgive me if you're trying to call inconsistency here. But I don't, I don't think you're going to see that from me. I could pull out the videos and we can watch them together at some point. Lewis trusts his race pace more. I think his problem is a straight line. Maybe in part to having a fast car for so long Kieran so I've heard that theory trotted out that because George has struggled wrestled with that dodgy Williams for more than a few years that he's used to extracting is King George Russell of Kings Lynn Norfolk first of his name he's used better adapted to extracting good from a bad car and I think there's something to that you know I think there is something to that George is younger and he's fightier isn't he got all of his career ahead of him and Lewis is at the tail end I think there's something to be said for the broader context the lens through which each of these drivers are seeing their that they're the future of their careers George is massively on the upward trajectory are we going to get into the age conversation you guys know me already I've made a gazillion videos talking about the historic statistics around 40 year old the success of 40 year old drivers in F1 and it's been few and far between. You can count them. The champions who won at 40 years or older for the avoidance of doubt forever. And there's been none recently. Nigel Mansell was like 38, 39. Mario Andretti was like 38 when he went in 78, I want to say. But 40 years and older, count them on one hand. Giuseppe Farina in 1950. Fangio when his last one in 57, he was he was well into his 40s at that point. Jack Brabham in 66, I want to say he was like 40-something. And then finally, Graham Hill in 68. Those are the only four men to win a Formula One championship at 40 years or older. Now, that's not to say that Lewis Hamilton isn't a pioneer and research and diet and hasn't advanced and these guys are looking after themselves better and their fitness levels have been that that as far as fitness levels ever who would argue possibly that these drivers are not the fittest drivers in all of f1 history nobody could argue that that would be nonsense but that does that mean to say that they are fit enough to make history do a 180 i don't know i still think it's a young man listen lewis is fit man i'm not gonna I wouldn't delve, I wouldn't swim in the murky waters of Lewis Hamilton being over the hill. Not just yet. We don't have evidence to that effect. Not yet. Not just yet. But these things tend to just happen overnight. I'll never forget, guys. Let me share this. What's going on, Flex? Um, oh, this is techie. This is really techie now. 
Eric says they could they could not double stack because they are not good enough in their pit stop. Eric, but what's happened there? You know what, Eric? You're going to get me riled up here. I'm trying to be cool, calm, collected Cameron today, but thinking about the operational if inefficiency. You've got, to, you've got to dare to be great in F1, right? You've got to dare to be great. And in 2019 Chinese Grand Prix, granted it wasn't safety car circumstance, but they double stacked magnificently. It's 2024 now. So why have Mercedes in terms of their pit stops and their operational efficiency? Why have they regressed? I, I, ju I just don't understand it. I, I just can't understand it. I, I don't know. And again, maybe at 39, Lewis can't be bothered with all that nonsense, right? Maybe he can't be bothered. Donnie says Lewis has got three championships left. If that, right, I think he's signed, has he signed a one plus one? No, he signed a two plus one, hasn't he, with Ferrari? So yeah, as at today's contract says that he's got three championships. Maybe they extend him, maybe they don't. Who's going to be 40 years old trying to fight a, a live wire in Charles Leclerc? He pretty much, you're, ne you're never going to out-qualify him ever. I do, you know, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know, peddlers. It feels like a proper, like, a time of depression for Lewis Hamilton fans. I feel like I'm being hit by a large dose of reality. But I digress. Alors says, Lewis did cooperate this year to make Mercedes to his liking the seat the media talk and it's worth noting without that um, it turns out Mercedes are a mid team and this is the chat right this is what George Russell keeps saying alluding to that listen we've we've harnessed we've made the car even in Lewis Hamilton's image this year he's gotten the seat moved back we try to tailor the handling dynamics it feels like George Russell has a beat in his bonnet around all this he's saying in brackets, unsaid. <laughs> I'm the guy that you should be building this car around, right? Because I'm the one staying. He's leaving. What, build the thing around me. And my te my peculiarities as far as what I want from where the seat is. How about you build it around me? Because I'm going to be here in, in, in the outer years. Lewis is not. So why are we bending the knee to this fella? And I hear it from George. That logically makes sense, doesn't it? It does make sense if you see it from George Russell's perspective. And it says, you guys know Red Bull will win until 2026. Yeah, act mad when they win. Go on then, Alex. I'll engage this finally. <laughs> oh my gosh. OC says, Charles will obliterate Luis when he comes to Ferrari. Will he, OC? Will he really, though? Flipping Nora. That is techie. He, he might do. I mean, look, if, if Lewis of 2024 turns up in 2025 and thinks that he's going to stand a chance, if Lewis can't beat George Russell when he's putting 100% in, then how is he going to rock up and beat Charles Leclerc? Faster, dude. Maybe less less strategically assertive versus George Russell, but I don't, I don't know. Bloody Norrie. He's going to be epic, isn't it? Peshala. Oh, I can't wait. Fast forward to 2025, please. Straight away, right away. Go on then, let's talk about this Red Bull thing very quickly. Um, here he is. The guys at Lucky Sons. Stevie P, Andy, what's going on? Um, go on then, let's talk about this Red Bull monotony then. Finally, before I run away. Um, why would you tune in as an... Okay, look, the backdrop, before I get onto my, my rant... The backdrop for this narrative is that last year, 10% of the North American fan base disappeared. 53% of fans currently watching F1 have come to the sport via Drive to Survive. And we all know what Drive to Survive is. Bubblegum, like a crack cocaine type of F1 product. It's designed to attract new, younger eyes, right? The fabled 18 to 35 demographic those who have got money to spend and will have money in the out years to spend because they'll, they'll be around so then how do you marry the drive to survive eyes explain to the drive to survive eyes why they should watch yet another season the third consecutive season when we know 
before we even rock up on free practice on Friday, we know 99% of the time who's going to win. Why would they watch? You've got to give these guys a re and girls a reason to watch. Drive to Survive was their reason, but now they've got a mismatch. They feel like they've been missold a product, right? 2021, fresh in the memory, it was Max and it was Lewis. We got gangbusters, automotive pugilism, the upper echelons of every single race week. But what now? It's not happening now. What, you want me to invest in one, one man's excellence? What are you talking about? That's just nonsense. Uh, listen, I'll be watching, don't get it twisted, but I'm not the 53%. I'm the 47%. I'm the boring, grey-bearded diehard who's always going to be here, right? Irrespective of what's going on on track. I'm, I'm, I love F1, but the 53% that Liberty Media are trying to attract and keep as new fans of the sport, they're going to be dialing off by the second. So how do they resolve for this? I, I, I have no clue. I don't, I don't know. Did the FIA intervene? The problem with that RB20 is that it's, there's no soft, vulnerable underbellies there. It's just a brilliant car. Venturi tunnels nailed. Ground effect optimized. Super aerodynamically efficient. As near as makes no different. Everywhere, at every racetrack, this F1 calendar. So how do you fix for that? Sh shy of bloody ballasts and putting weights on their car. How do you fix for that? But I think the salient point in all of this is that people will start dialing out. Why? Listen, F1 is a labor of love, right? People work 40 hour weeks and you want them to put in another full, another full time equivalent, another seven and a half hours over the course of a race weekend to watch something that, that, you know, the outcome to already, mate. Yeah. I don't know. Joma says, off the track drama is lucrative equals drive to survive. Well, Joma, you've seen them already rocking up, trying to film next year's season, eh? You saw the cameras and the bloody boo mic of the Netflix production crew filming Christian Horner when he was doing his PR stuff with his missus, Ginger Spice, Jerry Halliwell. I, I, think, I think part of the solution is potentially, I don't think they can do netflix drive to survive once a year i think it should be like biannually twice a year quarterly even because we need something there needs to be more reasons to keep watching because people are going to start to dial out i'm telling you it's happening already guys the 53 percent are dialing out rapidly and i can't blame them for it i'm not going to be the karen chanduk to say well these are the Max Verstappen is so excellent that if you're not watching, then you may as well go and watch another sport. I can't do that gatekeeping shenanigans. I think it's wrong. It's unacceptable. I can't digest nor swallow that gatekeeping pill. I've had people do it to me. Oh, wow, well, Cameron, you don't watch F1 in the right light. You need to pursue... Ugh, mate, the, the best F1 minds won't do that to you necessarily. They, they, they're... It's got to be open arms policy, right? An open door policy as far as F1 in order for the sport to continue. Grow. I don't want it to become like it was back in the day. I remember, guys, I remember back in the day as a young pup in secondary school at the age of like 12 or 13. I remember in class, there's one of a boy, my mate Andrew Busby, yeah? <laughs> shout out to him. There was one other boy in that class who watched F1, a class of 24. And whenever we go biology, we'd spend the whole class just like, just sharing our F1 experience. What do you think of Jacques Villeneuve? Is he going to come in and be able to beat Michael Schumacher? It was almost like, F1 was almost like a, a top shelf club. It's like a dirty secret, right? Like, do you watch F1 on the weekend? Or did you watch the race? Like, what? It was like completely different. It, it hadn't yet considered or, or been even it hadn't even been able to conceive of crossing over into the mainstream it just wasn't ready it's almost like bernie eccleston didn't want it to nor max mosley to just wanted to cake off of it monetize it but as far as mainstream 18 to 35 year old demographic bernie eccleston said explicitly for the avoidance of doubt that i don't want to attract them because they don't have young people don't have money it's rich white 
males. That, that's who we're targeting, older 40 to 60 year olds who have done their careers already and become chief execs or or on the chair at chair of the board and all that. That's what F1 was. And to a certain extent, that's what F1 still is. So me talking with my my old mate Andrew Busby at 12 years old. Oh, nobody understood the language that we were talking. What slip streams and ape in apex out like, what are you talking about? Up and under switchbacks. Like, it was like a we were talking Spanish. Nobody understood. And what Drive to Survive has, has successfully done is translate those messages in a way that 18 to 35 year old new fans can understand, put, package it. I can't feed my son broccoli without a bit of salt and pepper. You've got to package it in a way that's digestible, right? Can't just be like, oh, this technical venture tunnels and aerodynamically efficient that RB, RB20s and so successful and dominating have they been over the ensuing nobody's nobody can listen to that takes too long and too much effort package this thing in a way that people can understand and stop being so gatekeepy about it stop it it's nonsense otherwise people are going to continue to dial out Alex says they can watch keeping up with the Kardashians if they want entertainment this is a sport Alex have you ever heard the term sports entertainment? Sports entertainment. So that's traditionally the the way they that's the umbrella term for well like wrestling, right? Wrestling, WWE, which of course there is kayfabe and the stories are predetermined. But you gotta kind of the brilliance of wrestling and the rock and the attitude era is that they were able to package it up in a way that would keep somebody like myself dialed in. I don't even like wrestling. This Roman Reigns stuff that's going on in the lead up to bloody WrestleMania and it's the rock and it's the blood. I'm not interested in that rubbish because it's interesting and they've they've packaged it in a way that I can't, I can't recoil from it. Indeed, I'm drawn to it and I don't even watch wrestling. So what you said there, Alex, I hear you. I hear you. They can go and watch kids. But even the terms in which you couch... That is very is gatekeeping, right? That's traditional F1 speak. Well, actually, they can go and watch Keeping Up With The Kardashians, can't they? If they don't want to watch it, if they don't want to revel in the excellence ad infinitum of Max Verstappen, then they can go and, do you know what I mean? Look at the hand, they can go and do what? And I just think it's it's too, it's far too gatekeeping, for my liking at least. I think I think it's too gatekeeping. We, we've been there. And I think we need to come out from that deep, dark gatekeeping cave. It's it's not commensurate with what with where Liberty Media want to go ultimately, as they're licensing and patenting Chicago Grand Prix. They want to do more races, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I digress. Right, Alex, wrestling scripted. No sports main attraction is that that it's competitive. So ha all right, so Alex, so you make the point right. Sports main attraction is that it, it needs to be competitive. But what's happened to that, Alex? For the past three bloody years? Where's that been, mate? And therein lies your issue. You need, on your waterfall analysis, you need an offset. If you don't have that bar that represents competitiveness, which you don't at the moment, or haven't for the last two years at least, and, and won't for this year. So that com competition bar is dwindling to one of these. What's going to offset that, Alex? What, what's going to draw people to this? Because that bar's shrunk. That attractive portion has shrunk. So what's, where's your offset? What's going to replace that? I, I have no idea. It's up to Liberty Media to figure it out. Henron, what's going on, mate? I hope you're good. Henron says, Cam, I think Merck are too complacent in not updating the simulated model and not reflecting on their car shows. They're probably not updating simulator OS. They should follow Red Bull and McLaren. All right, to your, to your final point, Henman, I'm not sure that following are in terms of Winton. Okay, fair. Well, Toto Wolf has come out and said already that they're not correlating, are they? That they're seeing similar story to bloody 22 and 23. That they're seeing pace in their models, in the wind tunnel and the CFD, but that's not translating to untrapped pace. Hence, why they were bloody so slow, losing tenths to the lights of McLaren in sector one. The Jeddah Corniche circuit, they need to sort it out. It's not good enough. But I digress. I digress. Right. 
I'm going to go make a video. Thank you so much for listening, watching. I've enjoyed the chat, the back and forth. I enjoy you guys challenging me. If you're not subscribed already, do me a favor and smash the subscribe. If you like the content, as always, be sure to hit the like on your way out. You guys have been legends. I will catch you on the other side. But between now and then, as always, remember to look, but never stare. Bye.